Well, today's scripture comes from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. And uh, we're going to do an alternate reading. Uh, we're going to read it in the NIV, uh, which uh, most of the pew Bibles there are NIVs. Uh, you can also look that up in a Bible app uh, if you so desire it. Um, and so once you find the scripture, uh, we ask that you stand for the reading of God's word. I'll read the first verse. We'll all respond with the verse after that. And we'll keep going back and forth until the end. So again, it's Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. Uh, if you could please stand as able. May the Lord bless the reading of his word today. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Amen. Well, friends, we are c continuing in our sermon series, Metanoia, which is the Greek word for repentance. And this whole sermon series is about actually turning and changing and being different people. Um, brothers and sisters, I do want to say a little disclaimer. Uh, today's message is going to be challenging. Uh, there are some scriptures that are especially challenging that really hear, uh, hear, sound very strange to our ears. Uh, some of the things you hear today might sound kind of strange to your ears. I want to encourage uh, for some of our younger folks, um, if there are things that you do not understand in the sermon, uh, I want to encourage you to talk to your parents about it. <laughs> you can talk to me as well, uh, but uh, it, we, we sent an email out to the parents to let you know that we'd be talking about some of these things today. Um, Brothers and sisters, uh, this is called Roots Part 2, is this message, uh, which is uh, kind of a continuation of last week. We'll get into what, what that's about. Uh, but the question we posed last week that I want to pose again, because this is a very important question for the spiritual life, for us to be very honest. No matter where you are in the spiritual life, this is a very important question. Do you really want to be like Jesus? You see this uh, uh, bracelet, the WWJD bracelet, where people would ask this question, what would Jesus do? And it came out of this desire to actually be like Jesus. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a little bit. I think WWJD means well, but I think it's very limited. I think people found it very, very difficult to be like Jesus. But the question remains, do you want to be like Jesus? Now, for those of us in the church, most of us are supposed to say yes. <laughs> But this is the thing, and we're going to be talking about this uh, uh, in, in, in the uh, praise night this coming week, where we're talking about what is your heart's cry? Dallas Willard had this way of talking about the kingdom of God. Uh, we've been talking about this the whole year. The kingdom of God, God actually reigning in your life. If God actually reigned in your life, your life would look different. And what he said about the kingdom is, unless you want the kingdom more than you want anything else in your life, you will not get it. Unless you seek the kingdom more than anything else, you want it more than anything else in life, you won't get it. Now, is that true? <laughs> well, brothers and sisters, I mean, uh, let, let's just posit that that might be true. So the question is, do you want the kind of life that Jesus had? Again, I know we're all in the church supposed to say yes, <laughs> but this is the thing. Do you really want that? I'm not just talking Sunday school answers, but really, what do you want? What do you want in life? To put it another way, what do you dream about? <laughs> what is your greatest desire? When you are up at night, in bed, thinking about something that really excites you, 
Do you dream about being like Jesus? Do you? (laughs) You probably dream about different things, don't you? What most of us probably dream about is the good life. Dallas Willard had these important questions for life that all of us need to answer at some point. And one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is, what is the good life? What is the good life? And there's a second question that we need to ask. And the answer to this question oftentimes is different than the first. The second question is, who is a good person? And so what is the good life may be different things for you. Um, I, I want to try to uh, <laughs> give an illustration of what some people might think the good life is uh, through a Diet Coke commercial. Maybe some of you guys saw this commercial. Um, uh, it's kind of a, a, well, I think it's kind of a silly commercial. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I think they're dead serious. And this is what marketers think people want. And so let's take a look at this. Uh, th- this is Diet Coke trying to answer the question, what is the good life? Here's the thing about Diet Coke. It's delicious. It makes me feel good. Thanks. Life is short. If you want to live in a yurt, yurt it up. If you want to run a marathon, I mean, that sounds super hard, but okay. I mean, just do you, whatever that is. And if you're in the mood for a Diet Coke, have a Diet Coke. Diet Coke. Because I can. (laughs) Okay. I don't know about you, but I think this commercial is so ridiculous on so many levels. Well, one of the things is like, did you see in the beginning? She's like, drink Diet Coke because it's delicious. It's like, it doesn't look like it's delicious, right? <laughs> it tastes good, right? Like, really? <laughs> you sure it tastes good? Because it doesn't really seem like it's so healthy. But okay, so this is the thing that, that's so funny about this commercial. I mean, there's many things that are funny. Uh, so Diet Coke uh, has been under a lot of attack because people have found that um, people actually don't lose weight when they drink Diet Coke, and they find that it, it may be actually more unhealthy than regular Coke. And so they came out with this commercial that they're like, okay, we're not, they used to be like, Diet Coke, drink it because it's good for you, right? It'll make you feel good because you'll feel like you're healthier. They're like, just drink it because you can, right? Like, if you want to, then drink it, you know? <laughs> okay, we, we acknowledge it's probably bad for you, but dr- drink it because you can, right? Uh, and so there's this statement that they make, which is one of the very common statements that uh, uh, Madison Avenue likes to make, that people who make advertisements like to make. They say, life is short. Do what feels good. Do what you want to do. This is the American dream. If you want to drink a Diet Coke, drink a Diet Coke. And she even says this thing, you want to drink a marathon, or you want to drink a marathon. You want to run a marathon. Uh, She's like, I don't know why you want to do that. That sounds really difficult. Just drink a Diet Coke. That's easy, right? And this is for a lot of us, is we uh, are naturally attuned This is the natural default setting, that we do what feels good and what we feel like doing, right? And we think that this will get us the good life. What is the good life? Advertisers will tell you. You know, they'll get an attractive model, you know, who looks hip and put together, you know, and has got perfect hair. And we might look at these kinds of things and think, okay, the good life is having perfect hair, having white teeth, you know, uh, having a lot of money, (laughs) having a nice car, having a nice green lawn, you know, those sorts of things. But when it comes to, you know, what we dream about, what advertisers uh, uh, try to dangle in front of you, it is this. But what matters most? Is this really what matters most? Uh, In other sermons, I mean, we're not going to go back over this, but we try to make the argument that it doesn't. These things wear off. These things are very temporary. And the problem with them is that you have to keep dangling them. You have to keep chasing them because they never satisfy, right? And that at the end of your life, when people are on their deathbed, um, you know, what people really think about, do they think about like, oh, man, I should have had more Diet Coke. You know, like, oh, man, you know, I I wish I had a bigger house. 
I wish I had a greener lawn, you know. But what do people talk about in, in people's, uh, you know, like, like uh, in eulogies at, at funerals? People talk about how good of a person they were, don't they? When you sum up a person's life, they're like, you know what? At the end of the day, so-and-so was a really good person. He loved his family. He cared for the poor. Those sorts of things, right? Those are the things that tend to matter the most. Have you ever been to a funeral? Because I haven't. Have you ever been to a funeral where they say, you know what? So-and-so had really good hair. They had really white teeth. They had a really green lawn, right? They had a big car. They had lots of money. No. It seems as if we have these two competing things. And by the way, there are many people who think that they want the good life. And, you know, to be honest, doing what you want to do whenever you feel like doing it actually is a disaster for most people. It does not get you what you want. Brothers and sisters, just look at the world. Most people do what they want when they feel like doing it. That's most people. Has that produced a good world? Has that produced healthy whole lives? In most cases, it doesn't. And there might be people, when you ask them in moments of clarity, what do you really, really want? Like, really want? Let's say there's uh, an addict, you know, drug addict or you know, alcohol or something like that. You ask them, what do you really want? They might say, I want to be whole. I don't want to be addicted anymore. I want to be reconciled with my family. You know, I don't, I don't really want to be in pain, but I want it to be permanent. Now, that's a different question. What do you really want? versus what do you feel like doing? Because if you ask an addict, what do you feel like doing? They're going to say, I feel like using that substance. I feel like shooting up. I feel like drinking, right? And if, you, if that addict does what they feel like doing, whenever they feel like doing it, do you think they will get what they really want? No, right? Do you see it, brothers and sisters? There is this thing that we have heard our whole lives that it's been dangled out in front of us. And we see so many results of what that kind of life has brought people. It has not brought people abundant fullness of life. It, not, it has not brought them peace, not lasting peace, at least. It has not brought them lasting joy. It gives them little moments of, of enjoyment, of course, but those moments of enjoyment are gone as quick as you can drink a Diet Coke, right? It's gone so quickly, almost as quickly as it comes. And it does not last. You're left feeling empty. It does not give you real love, not real lasting love. It gives us these kind of artificial relationships that are based on transactions. So brothers and sisters, this is the question. Right? I know we don't dream about being like Jesus for most of us, but maybe we should. There are many of us who, uh, maybe you've been through some stuff in life. This is usually what happens for some people. For some people, maybe you're a little bit younger. I, I don't want to be ageist in any way. But for a lot of us, when we're younger, you know, maybe you haven't gone through that much suffering or pain. You know? You've got these dreams and things that you think will satisfy you because, I mean, you haven't had a chance to be disappointed by them yet. But maybe for some of us who have lived some life, you have found that those things have been wanting. And you have found that wherever you go, there you are. No matter what you have in this world, you are going to have yourself, right? You know, and, and that there are anxious people who try to surround themselves with lots of money or pleasure or lots of things to insulate themselves from these things. But as soon as the momentary pleasures, the momentary feelings go away, they're going to be left with their anxiety. They're going to be left with their fear. You're going to be left with your stress, your worry, your loneliness, whatever it is. And so what we have been saying, and this is part of the reason why we are talking about roots, Jesus does not want to just fix the fruits. 
He doesn't just want to fix the branches. He wants to fix the tree itself, and he wants to go down to the roots. What do you really want? If you want peace and love and joy and contentment, because I think everyone wants this. This is why you really pursue those things, because you think those things will deliver. But brothers and sisters, I mean, don't just take it on my authority. Don't just take it because I'm the guy up here talking. Search your own heart. Look at your own experience. And if you don't believe me, maybe someday you'll find out. I, I'm not trying to be condescending. I'm being serious. Because at the end of the day, whether you believe me or not, right, is going to be really based on the truth that you find out. If I'm not steering you right, if Jesus is not steering you right, if he is, doesn't really offer the best way of life, then why pursue it? Why pursue the, 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 this way if it is not the best life for you? Brothers and sisters, I, I, I want to come really clean. I want you to be able to find the fullness of life that God ha has for you. And I believe that when Jesus comes, he comes offering his very way of life. And so, another way to ask this question, right, is being like Jesus the good life? You know, is it actually something that we should be pursuing more than you pursue money? I'm being serious. More than you pursue your career, more than you pursue fill in the blank, these things that are only temporary. Brothers and sisters, I'm not telling you that you don't need these things. I'm not telling you that they're not good. I'm telling you that they're not as good as being like Jesus. Having the Jesus sort of life. If you have this, then those other things are just a cherry on top. Your money, your job, everything else, it's not going to be the thing that makes or breaks you or defines you or gives you ultimate joy. It'll be just something that you can enjoy. And when it goes away, because it will, you won't be left feeling empty because you will already be full, right? You won't need this thing to be your ultimate thing, right? Now, <laughs> So the other question that Dallas Willard likes to ask um, of these very important questions for life is, uh, so what is reality? What is the good life? What is a good person? And do you really believe that those two things are the same? And if you believe that being a good person is part of the good life, how then do you become a good person? And this is where this little cute picture lies to us. <laughs> and this is the problem, because this is what most of us think we're supposed to do. Right? It's so cute. This little girl, you know, who's sitting next to Jesus. I think it's a girl. Not sure. <laughs> Saying, I'm trying to be like Jesus. I'm trying to be like Jesus. And there are many people who have tried to be like Jesus and they've failed. There's a lot of churches who mean well. There's a lot of times pastors get up here. I'm sure I've done it where I say, try really hard to be like Jesus. And what you will find is you can't. Uh, Dallas Whitler likes to say, um, there are some things in life that you cannot try to do. You must train. And this is part of the reason why we use the word discipleship, right? Disciple means that you are a student. You are an apprentice. If you are an apprentice at carpentry, you cannot try really hard to be a good carpenter. You must train. You can't be like, hey, can you make this pew right now with no skill? This is what we do to Christians. We, you know, dump them into life and we say, try really hard to be like Jesus. Go forgive these people. Go deal with your anger issues. Go deal with your lust issues. Go deal with your greed and your selfishness. Now try really hard. Brothers and sisters, there are many things that we understand that you cannot do it by trying, by direct effort, but you can do by training. So Dallas Willard has this thing where he, he asks people, how many people in this room right now, just right now, like literally we could go out of this building right now and you could run, not walk a marathon, 26.2 months. Is there anyone here who could do that right now? Okay, I see, I see some, like, like maybe one person. Okay, 
who's very fit or maybe telling a little bit of a lie. <laughs> One of those, right? <laughs> now, what about this? What if I said, okay, now I want you to try really hard. Will that make a difference? <laughs> Maybe in the beginning, you're going to be like, I'm going to try my best. I'm going to try my best. But after a while, your lungs, <laughs> your cardiovascular health, your metabolism was not transformed by just trying, right? But how about this? If I said for the next six months, we are going to train to run this marathon every single day. How many of you could run that marathon after six months of training? Every single one of you, you, you know how I know this? Because I see on YouTube, there's like 95-year-old people who run marathons. You can do it, right? You definitely could if you train. How many of us do we go to people in the church who have no training and we say, just try harder? It doesn't work, right? We, we posted this last week too, but I think, you know, this is Roots Part 2. You can't change your behavior without dealing with the roots, right? This is what most of us do, right? Um, <laughs> let's say you're anxious. <laughs> I've used this example before, but I think it's a good example. Has anyone ever told you, don't be anxious? My, my dad called me a couple weeks ago, and I was talking about my, my blood pressure and my, uh, my um, cholesterol, and all of these things are exacerbated by stress. And a lot of these things are very high in my family, and there's genetic reasons for that. And what my dad told me is like, Steve, did you know that stress is the worst factor for all of your health? So this is what he said. Very good fatherly advice, right? He said, so don't be stressed. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Now I won't be stressed, right? I, I've used this example before. Have you ever been like really worked up about something? And maybe someone who loves you, a partner, a boyfriend, girlfriend, a member of your family, your father, your mother said, calm down. Did that work? Did that make you more calm? You're like, okay, well, I didn't think of that. Now I'll be calm. You can't do it by direct effort, right? Have you ever been like, like in a rage and someone says, don't be angry? Like, oh, Right? All of these things, they do not work by direct effort, but this is what most of us try to do. And this is why we fail spectacularly. We are only dealing with the branches. Maybe some of us, and we're going to be talking about lust today, this is one that I always heard, that people would tell you, just don't do it. Just don't do that bad thing. Don't go on the internet, don't look at that stuff, right? And so maybe one day, one day you have like really strong willpower and you don't do it. Does it solve your problem forever? I, I, I don't want to just pick on the men, but I know it does tend to be, uh, some of these issues tend to be uh, something that affects men more. I'm not saying exclusively, but just more. And for some of you who've struggled with looking at certain things, has it helped to just deal with the behavior? Just don't do it. Just stop. Right? I know some guys that they would put like locks on their computer, right? Or they download programs that get sent to an accountability partner every time they try to log on to a bad website, right? Does that work in the long run? Brothers and sisters, what we are hearing here is it will not because it's not addressing the roots. Look at this tree. The tree is only one part of it, but look how long and big that root system is. If you just pluck out the tree, if you just pluck out the plant, it will grow back. And that's the problem. This is the problem with the righteousness of the Pharisees. This is the problem with the law. The law does say that there's a standard. God has a standard. God does not want you to do these things. It helps indicate the problem, but it does not give you the solution. Because the solution in many cases, this is the righteousness of the Pharisees, is to just stop the behavior and do good behavior. And it does not work. Let's take a look at what Jesus actually says in this passage. And so we, we were talking about anger last week, and we're picking up right after that, and now we are talking about um, lust. And so last week, we talked about anger, how the law only deals with certain kinds of behavior, and it lets a lot of things hide, right? So, you know, it says, you have heard it said, do not murder. 
But I say, don't hate your brother or your sister. I say, don't have contempt for them under your breath, muttering in frustration. I say, don't call them a stupid moron or some name, right? And so Jesus is trying to address all of those behaviors in your attitude, in your heart, not just the stuff that comes out on the outside. So a Pharisee could hide behind that. They could hate their brother or their sister, right? And, and, and like, like be staring daggers at them, but say, well, I didn't kill them. <laughs> I didn't punch them in the face, right? And Jesus is saying, just not punching them in the face is not good enough. Your righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. It must be complete. I have come to fulfill the law, fill it out, in terms of what is actually in your heart, right? And so we see that here. You have heard that it was said, that same structure. You have heard that it was said, you shall not murder, right, last week. Now it's you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, sleep with someone who is not your husband or wife. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart, right? So here you see that Jesus is addressing a lot of the behavior that leads to the ultimate act of the adultery. The, the lustful look, that there's people who probably would commit adultery if they had the opportunity, right? But maybe they're lacking the opportunity. But Jesus is also addressing some of the behavior that goes into that, right? That, that if you continue looking at, at women or men and lusting after them and treating them like an object for your sexual satisfaction, then there's going to be something that is formed within you that may come out eventually as an actual behavior, as the actual act, right? But he goes back even further to the lustful intent. What is in your heart, right? And brothers and sisters, I, I, I want to address this because I think there are a lot of people who look at this. Nowadays, these kinds of teachings are, seem so outdated. You know, there, there's a lot of us that would say, oh, Pastor Steve, come on, this is so old-fashioned, right? You know, th 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 it just sounds like Jesus is this huge cosmic killjoy who doesn't want you to do things that are fun or enjoyable, you know? And that for a lot of people, they're like, yeah, but it feels so good. It feels so good, right? We have this saying. It's not in the, the Bible. This is definitely not from the Bible. If it feels good, do it. If it feels good, it must be good. Again, I go back to the drug addict. Ask the drug addict. If it feels good, it must be good. Is it good for them? No. There are many people who've wrecked their marriages, wrecked their lives on this philosophy. If it feels good, do it. Right? Jesus is not trying to be a cosmic killjoy. He is trying to teach you the abundance of life, the kingdom kind of life. We're going to address why this is such a big problem in a moment. But let's continue for now. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Brothers and sisters, this is my little disclaimer. I don't know exactly what this means but I'm going to give you my best, most educated guess and investigations from reading people who are smarter than me, people who have studied the scripture, okay? But do I know definitively what this means? I'm not sure. There's a literal meaning that says, hey, if your hand is causing you to sin, cut off your hand, right? Is that what Jesus really means? I think what he is trying to say is he's trying to show us that just dealing with the outer stuff is not enough. He's trying to show us, by the way, that there is a progression to your sin. Your sin can get worse and carry more punishments, more consequences, I should say, right? And so I, I know that using the word hell is very uh, evocative for a lot of us, right? that uh, it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. 
But for a lot of us, this scripture doesn't mean anything. Because we believe in Jesus, and we believe that Jesus died for our sins, therefore, we will not go to hell. So what the heck does this mean? Right? Did anyone really fear that if you, you know, were to lust after someone, that you're going to go to hell? Without Jesus, that might be a fear. But with Jesus, is that a fear? Now, by the way, I think we should treat it on the same level as last week. Because it also talked about hell, the fires of hell. Right? It said, if you uh, say to your brother or sister, you fool, you call them a stupid moron, you think of them as a categorically different person, you are liable to the fires of hell. In other words, brothers and sisters, what Jesus is talking about is the consequences of our actions. And in this case, what he's talking about, I think, and again, there may be different interpreta- interpretations for this, that it is better for you to lose one of your members of your body. If there is something that is really causing you to sin, right, and causing you such problems, what were to happen if you let that sin become full-blown? If you were to actually commit that adultery, what would happen to, let's say you're married, to your marriage? A lot of people don't think that through. A lot of people don't think through what are the full consequences of that. They just feel like doing it. So in that moment, then they do it. But the long-term consequences, you may wish, you may think that you're in hell. The consequences that you are suffering from that. It is better that you were to address that thing, if that were to help. But that is a very important question. If... Your right eye causes you to sin. Wouldn't it be better to tear it out and throw it away? Dallas Willard thinks this is a little tongue-in-cheek. That he thinks like, heaven isn't populated by a bunch of people missing eyes and limbs, right? That he's saying, if this were to help, then by all means do it so you actually stop sinning. But is this the thing that ultimately causes you to sin? Is it your eye? Is it your hands? No, there is something deeper. I I was in uh, accountability groups for the longest time with a lot of brothers where we would talk about uh, sins of lust, you know, different things you look at on the internet, these kinds of things, right? And one of the things that that one of my brothers helped me to see is, is he said, Steve, I don't know about for you, but for me, when I am most susceptible to this sin is when I am lonely. When I'm lonely, the cause of the sin wasn't my hands that typed on the keyboard, right? So I need to cut off my fingers so I don't type on the keyboard, right? The real root of that is this profound, deep loneliness. And for a lot of people, that watching these scenes on a computer is kind of like simulated intimacy. Is it real intimacy? No. But it it, it has no risk for a lot of people, right? It doesn't risk vulnerability. You can't be rejected by your computer in most cases, right? It's this quick, easy fix that doesn't fill the void, but it's kind of like a proxy, right? It's kind of like like, like close to uh, sort of, you know, your mind can kind of imagine yourself in that scenario. And for some people, we don't even realize that's what it's doing. We just do it because it's become habit. For some people, there may be different causes. I'm not saying it's always because you're lonely. And so actually what some of us started doing, instead of being like, don't do it, stop, because that didn't help. What we would do is, hey, you know what? Brother, the next time you are feeling tempted in this way, give me a call and we'll go hang out. We'll go play some ping pong, right? We'll play a video game, you know, or I'll pray for you. We'll talk on the phone for a little bit. And that actually seemed to help, right? You know, uh, There are other people that they've learned this as a a response to stress. There's stress and anxiety in your life. And so we have found that this is something that just gives you a quick little thrill. And so that's why people do it. So we're we're not addressing the stress and anxiety. Um, There there is an acronym that uh, my counselor used to use uh, for when people indulge in destructive behavior. 
Um, it was called uh, Bee Halt. <laughs> and what it, what it is is bored, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Sometimes, you know, there are people who are just, you're angry, you're lonely, you're bored, you're tired, right? And you do these things not because, you know, doing that thing or, you know, that somehow there's some kind of flaw within you. The flaw is that you learn this behavior as your coping mechanism. But this is endemic to all human beings. It's a part of all of us, is that we have these longings. Jesus knows that. He wants you to get to the root of it. If it were to help to you to prevent living this kind of life, getting into this kind of trouble, then by all means do it. But for most of us, it isn't enough. You have to get to the root of the issue. And for many of us in the church, and this is part of the reason why I preach about this, I know some of you are young. And for some people, we're like, oh man, why are we talking about this in church? Because this is the stuff of life. How could we not? Isn't this the kind of stuff that we should be talking about in small groups? Or, I mean, maybe your small group isn't that place, but, you know, shouldn't this be the thing you're talking about with your fellow brothers and sisters? Maybe there's someone you trust that you can actually be talking about the stuff of life. You know what? I'm really lonely. You know what? I'm really worried. I'm really stressed. For most of us in the church, we only go surface deep. Don't do the bad stuff. But we don't go to the heart. And so we don't go nearly deep enough. That's what Jesus wants. Your righteousness, the rightness of your life, must go down to the roots, right? There, there's a, another part that talks about divorce. And so I do want to address this quickly. Um, and so when it talks about divorce, um, it says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This was a very controversial statement. Not just now, but it was back then. There, there are many times where the disciples, where different people would ask Jesus about this. This is Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 19, the, he gets asked this again. The Pharisees came up to him and tested him by say, asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered again, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and, and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Um, and, and then he says again, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual, for sexual immorality, excuse me, and marries another, commits adultery. But brothers and sisters, let's go back here. What is the Pharisee's question? Is it lawful to divorce one's wife? They're, he's very specific here. They're not d divorce one's spouse for any reason. Because in the Mosaic law, only the husband can initiate a divorce. A wife cannot divorce a husband for any reason. Any reason. But a husband can divorce a wife for any reason. You don't like your, her hair. You just don't feel like being married to her. You could divorce her for any reason. Is that fair? <laughs> Is that right? No. And there's some people that after Jesus came up with this, this uh, you know, after he taught them this, he's like, man, it, maybe it's better not to get married. You know? They're like, what? Pfft, I'm stuck with this woman? I have to be married to her no matter what? And, and so, of course, Jesus' 12 disciples were all men, right? And they're like, Psh, man, that seems harsh. They're not thinking for one second, but what about the women? What happens to them? And you know what would happen to a woman in many cases if a man just discarded her? Hey, you're not pleasing me today. Away with you. Hey, let's write a certificate of divorce. You go on your merry way. I'm going to remarry. It was no sweat off the guy's back. He could very easily remarry. But for the woman, it was a huge stigma. To be a divorced woman was a huge taboo. It, it was a gigantic double standard. Brothers and sisters, all of this stuff... 
Everything is pointing to the fulfillment of the law that we've been talking about. What is the fulfillment of the law? What is the royal law? What is the most important commandment? To love the Lord your God, which every good Jew knew. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. That was not controversial. The second one, Jesus put on the same level, and this was controversial. He said, love your neighbor as if they were you. As if they were you. Are you loving these women as if they were you? Definitely not. Definitely not. Men, we can do whatever we want, but women can not. So what are the things that Jesus points to when he talks about, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? This question. And he says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? There's no difference. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. One flesh. You have become one now. Love your neighbor. Love your wife. Love your brother, your sister, as if they were you, as if they were your flesh. What is the problem with lust? Lust is about fulfilling some sort of thing that we want, to get some kind of sexual satisfaction for us at the expense of someone else. We talk about the objectification of men and women nowadays. Right? where we look at them as some kind of sexual object. We don't even see them as human beings who have a full history. The worst examples of this, the, 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 when you go down the line of depravity, is that we have a problem in this world. It is a very common problem. It is called human trafficking. We treat human beings as if they were things to be owned, bought, and sold. This is evil in the eyes of God isn't it? Right? And in many cases of human trafficking, not all, but a lot of them are sexual, are they not? Because we have reduced the humanity of people. We are not seeing their full humanity. And Jesus is saying unequivocally, this is not loving your brother or your sister as if they were you. This is not blessing them. This is not honoring them. This is not protecting them. This is not lifting them up. This is not my standard for human beings. So you may think that the only bad thing is that you adulterate your seed by having a a, a kid who's born out of wedlock who has some claim on your property. That's what some people thought. That's why they called it adultery. But brothers and sisters, it is more than that for Jesus. It is about the heart, the life, the kind of person he is creating, the kind of people who honor and respect and love one another as if they were you. Jesus is in the business of wanting, creating one flesh out of us. How can we do that when we objectify each other, when we use them only for our satisfaction and we discard them? Jesus says, no. I'm not saying, brothers and sisters, that there are no cases in this that Jesus can forgive. Jesus can forgive anything. But make no mistake, it is not God's standard, right? There are some people who divorce, and I want to be very clear about this. When I preached on this before, I've I've been careful to make this point. You may know people. You may have actually had a divorce yourself. And it does not mean you are exempt from the grace of God. It does not mean you cannot be forgiven, brothers and sisters. But I think what Jesus is simply saying is that the ways that we have treated people as being so expendable, this is not God's standard for us. Right? He wants us to be able to figure out how to reconcile, how to love one another as if they were us, and not so easily be like, yeah, this isn't working out. Right? And so there is always forgiveness and redemption. Right? And what's done is done for some people in the past, but it does not mean that we cannot live a new and better story in the future. This is what God desires for us. This is what God calls us to. This is the kingdom heart and mind that God is calling us to. This is the availability of the kingdom to actually be able to change. But I want to be very clear. It does not happen automatically and does not happen overnight. 
It takes time. It takes training. It takes being open to the Spirit of God. You can do it. There are a lot of us that, that we hear messages like this, and I've heard people say this. They're like, Pastor Steve, all the things you're preaching on, they sound so hard. Amen. They are hard. You cannot do them naturally. But there is nothing that is impossible for God through the Holy Spirit if you were to make yourself available. Your body has been very conformed to sin. It has been very conformed to being its own boss. It does not want Jesus to come in and reign. That's why that question is so important. Do you want this more than anything? Do you actually want Jesus to change our life? There's some of us, when we are being very honest, we're like, I know the Christian answer is supposed to be yes, but I actually don't. I want to enjoy my little, you know, side projects and my little side indulgences. I kind of like it. But if you really want the kind of life that Jesus had, if you are convinced that this is the best kind of life, brothers and sisters, you will receive it, not automatically, but through time. It is available to you. It can be done. It will happen more and more and more. Brothers and sisters, um, I I, I want us to, uh, I'm going to ask the priest team to come up, and maybe you can just look at this tree for a little bit. Um, it's such a sharp contrast, the left to the right. One that is barren and stripped and just doesn't really feel much hope. That may not be you right now, but maybe it is. This has been me many times. Even as a Christian, even sitting in church, even preaching before you, this has been me. This has been me. And on the right, when I really understand the kingdom, when I really understand that Jesus, his spirit can reign in my body, in my mind, in my soul, in my nervous system, that I can have all joy, love, and peace, and contentment, when I understand that that is actually available to me, brothers and sisters, I do want that. I mean, in this passage, Jesus is talking about where are your eyes? So many of us, we're, our eyes are on things that are just going to get you in trouble. <laughs> and let's be honest, that's what this passage is about. It's just going to get you in trouble. Maybe our eyes should be on something that is lasting, that is pure, that can lead to real peace. Maybe our eyes should be on Jesus and his character his life. Brothers and sisters, I, I just let's just take a moment to just soak in this. To pray. To be open to this possibility. Do I really want this? Do I believe? And it's okay, brothers and sisters, if the answer is no. But at least be honest. Do I believe that the Jesus kind of life is the good life? Is the best sort of life. Is that what I want? Do I want wholeness? Wholeness in my relationships. Wholeness in my attitudes toward other people. Brothers and sisters, there may be some people in this room who have been the victims of people who have not treated you with that respect who have not treated you as if you were a God-created masterpiece, a child of God. Brothers and sisters, I am not promising you that this will get healed right away. But I do believe in the Holy Spirit. I do believe when Jesus came to heal. That's why so many of the stories of Jesus are about healing, isn't it? That's the kingdom reality. He wants to bring healing into your life. Maybe you've learned patterns and behaviors of relationship. It's not your fault, but you're stuck with it. You've been living that out in your life, and you want to break that cycle. Can we just cry out and say, God, I want your kingdom. God, I want your kind of life. I want to be able to know the sufficiency of your spirit 
to know that I don't need to seek and chase things outside of myself. I can have you in your way of life. Jesus, may this be true of all of us. May we have this des desire for you to cry out, we want your kingdom, we want Jesus. We want your Holy Spirit to lead us and reign in us now and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.